30 on the yeah. left. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Rabosai, we're on Daf Mem Vav Amad Aleph. We're on the third line. And we were learning yesterday about a, uh, a katana who accepts Kiddushin without her father's consent, which we had say, which we had seen is not valid, but according to at least Rav and Shmuel, she still needs to remedy the situation. So Itmar, in a related issue, Kitana Shaniskad Shalola Das let's say you have a minor who receives Kiddushin without her father's consent. So Omar Rav, Bain Hiu Vein Avia Yecholun Laakev, Verav Asi Omar Aviha Velohi. So you have a machlokus between Rav and Rav Asi. Rav says that both she and her father could put a stop to the Kiddushin. Now, what does this mean? Uh, so the Gemara is working under the assumption that she receives Kedushin if an hour later her father discovers it and he says, I consent to the Kedushin, so then that's a valid Kedushin. What would happen if in the interim, after she accepts the Kedushin, she says, you know, Father, I know that you may want, I'm telling you that I accepted Kedushin, and before the father has a chance to say that he's happy with it, she says, but I don't want it. I don't want to marry the guy. I've changed my mind. So Rob says she could put the brakes on it. And the reason is, even though a father could marry off his daughter, his daughter Baal Korcha, a father can, doesn't have to consult with his daughter, who's a katana, and who's, who's who she wants to marry. Even though the Gemara had said previously that it's not ethical, it's not a moral thing to do, but halachically it works. But over here, since the mechanism of Kiddushin is faulty to begin with because she received it without her father's consent, so then according to Rav, either she can put the brakes on it after the fact or the father can put the brakes on it. But Ravasi says no, only the father can put the brakes on it, but she can't. Once she's accepted it, if then an hour later the father accepts it, even if at that point she says, I've changed my mind, it's too late. So, so we have a kasha on Ravasi now that's brought from the following b'risa. Okay, so this is from Parshas Mishpatim. The Torah says that if a man seduces a virgin, and, uh, and she's totally single, but she's a virgin. And he sleeps with her, uh, has, you know, out of wedlock. So the Torah says, Mahor yim harenalo li'isha, then he's supposed to take her as his wife, but if the father refuses, because we're dealing with either a girl who's a katana or a naira, if the father refuses to give his daughter to this man for marriage, then the father is entitled to compensation for his daughter being now damaged good, so to speak. So, so what is what do we learn from this double language? Right. So aviha ainli ella aviha he atzma minayin tamalomer imo ain yimo ain mikol makom. So the refusal of allowing this man now to marry her is there's a double language for refusal, and that teaches me says the brisa that either the father or the daughter has the ability to do that. So at face value, just looking at this price, the question is as follows. You see that it's either the daughter's refusal or the father's refusal that could put a stop to the marriage. And the Gemara's Havamina is that the man slept with her for the sake of Kiddushin, but since she's a minor and does not have a right to independently accept marriage, they have to consult with the father. So at this point, either the girl or the father has the right to put the brakes on it. So Amr Luhu Rav, so Rav says, that's, you want to bring this price as a kasha on my rival Ravasi, but lo tezlu basar ibcha. Right? He says, don't follow a brisa that could be taught in a contrary fashion. That's not a proper kasha, because because Ravasi could very easily uh, get out of this kasha by saying, the Torah is not talking about a case where a man slept with a girl, L'Shem Kiddushin. He slept with her stam for the sake of Zunus. And that's the reason why either she or the father can put the brakes on it. But it, but it could be, Taka, that if he slept with her L'shem Ishus for the sake of Kiddushin, that maybe only the father could put the brakes on it and not the girl after the fact. How do we know what his reason was? 
perhaps there's Adam. There's Adam there. So Peter Shalola Shalola Shomishos Kra boy. So the Gemara says, I don't understand, Rob, how you're understanding the Pasuk. If a man sleeps with a girl for the sake of Znus, not for the sake of Kiddushin, so then what do you need a Pasuk to tell me at all that either one can refuse? There was no Kiddushin here. So why would I think that there is Kiddushin? So Amar Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak Lomar Shemeshalim Knas Kemefuta. So Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak says, no, 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 you're right. The Pasuk is not coming to tell me. The double language of ma'en yema'en is not coming to tell me that either one can put the brakes on the marriage because their taka is no marriage. What the chiddush of the pasuk is is that even though he did not sleep with her for the sake of kiddushin, the the the, the requirement is for the for the fellow to pay um, uh, kenas. That even if after the fact he says, you know what, I'll marry her. And uh, the father says, uh, well, maybe I'll consider it. If the daughter says no, that's what the b'risa means, that either one, either the father or the daughter, can refuse the proposal of matrimony and say, we'd rather take the cash. So that's the way you understand the b'risa. It's got nothing to do with Ravasi's case, where a man was makadei shaketana, uh, and then after the fact needs to consult the father. So Rav Yosef says, well, what Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak said makes a lot of sense, that that's the way the Bryce is understanding the Pasuk, because there's another Brysa, or maybe the continuation of the Brysa, that says that when the Torah says, Mahorim Harenaloli Isha, that he shall take her as a wife, this teaches that he, if he slept with her, he has to redo the Kiddushin. Now, if he already did the Kiddushin when sleeping with her, why does he have to redo the Kiddushin? So that proves that he slept with her Lushum Znus, not Lushum Ishus, not for the sake of Kiddushin. Exactly as Rav Nachum Bar Yitzchak has, has suggested. So Amr Le Abaya, no, Tzricha Kiddushin Ladas Aviha. Abaya says, not necessarily, you can't bring a raya from that line of the Brisa, because maybe what the Brisa merely means is that even if he did the bia for the sake of kiddushin, since it was not done with the consent of the father, he would re- have to have to redo it. So that line of the brisa is not proof to what we're suggesting, but at the end of the day, this brisa is not a kasha on Ravasi, and we end off with a machlokas between Rav and Ravasi, whether it's only the father that can put the brakes on the kiddushin, or whether the father or the girl who after the fact can put the brakes on the kiddushin. Let's go on to the next Mishnah. Haomer leisha hiskachili betamarazu hiskachili bezu im yesh beechas mehen shavapruta mikudeshes vimlav ena mikudeshes. If a man goes over to a girl and he says, "I'd like to take you out on a date," so here's a date, right? Okay. So anyway, so he gives her, but here's what he does: he says, "You are hereby mikudeshes to me with this date." Then he says, and you're hereby mikudeshes to me with this date. Now notice how the way he said it. And then he said a third time, and you're mikudeshes to me with this, with this date. So because he's divided his statement into three separate statements, each date is an independent mechanism of kiddushin. And therefore, if there is no shavapruta in each date, you do not say that you accumulate the value into one shavapruta. If there's no shavapruta in any uh, in any one date, she's not mikudeshes. Okay. However, by contrast, excuse me, bezu u bezu u bezu im ye shavapruta bekulan mikudeshes vimlav ena mikudeshes. But what if the man would say to the woman as follows? He says, "You are hereby mikudeshes to me with this date." and with this date, and with this date. So he's only made the declaration of Mikudeshes one time, and he says, with this date, with this date, with this date. So then, if you could have a cumulative value of one pruta among all three dates, so then she is Mikudeshes. Okay, next. Haisa ocheles rishona rishona eina mikudeshes ad shiyehi be'echas mehen shava pruta. Now this last case, we're going to call this the hungry girl case, okay? So why is it called the hungry girl case? Because he gives her a date, and before he has a chance to give her the next date, she's already eaten the first date. And he says, you're hereby mikudeshes to me with this and with this, but before he has a chance to finish saying with the next one, she's already eaten the first one. So there has to be 
in one of the dates of Shava Pruta, and if not, she's not Mekudesh. So the Gemara is going to have to clarify this last case, what it's talking about. We'll get to that in just a minute. Mantana hiskachi hiskachi, Amar Rabba, Reb Shimon Hido Amar, Achiyomer Shvu Alechol Echad Ve'echad. So the Gemara just points out that, you know who the author of our Mishnah is? Rabba says it's Reb Shimon from Masecha Shavuos. Now what's the case? There's a, there's a halacha that if a person swears falsely, that he doesn't owe somebody money, and then he confesses that he was lying. So the Torah says that he has to pay not only the principal, but he has to pay a penalty of 25% extra, plus he has to bring a carbon for taking a false oath. So the question is, what if there are multiple claimants against him, and he denies in one fell swoop all of their claims? There's like Ruvain Shimon and Levy come to me and they say, you owe, each one says, you owe me money. So Rabbi Shimon says, it depends how I deny their claim. If I say, Shavua, that I don't owe Ruvain money, and a Shavua, that I don't own Shimon, and a Shavua, that I don't own Le- Levi, so the halacha is, is that if I lied for all three, I have to bring three separate karbanos, because I said the word Shavua three times, so they're separated. However, if I said, I take a Shavua that I don't owe Ruvain money, and I don't owe Shimon money, and I don't owe Levi money, and then I turn out to be a liar, even if I lied for all three, I only have to bring one Shavua. So you see consistently that this is the same principle of our Mishnah, that if you say, you are here by Mikudeshis with this date, you are here by Mikudeshis with this date, we divide the statements because he's described the action uh, multiple times. So you, each each date is a separate mechanism of Kiddushan. But if he describes the action of Kiddushan only one time, with this date and with this date and with this date, it's like denying the claim with just taking one Shavuot. Okay. Now the Gemara says, Bezu, Vezu, Vezu, Imyesh Bekulon Shavapruta Chule. As we'll see, this next Gemara is going on the last case of the Mishnah where the, with the hungry girl. Let's take a look. Ahaya, what case is the hungry girl going on? Ilema Aresha, my Iria Ochelas, Afilu Manachas Nami, Doha Iskachili Bezuka Amar. He says, it can't be talking about the first case of the Mishnah, where he said, be Mekudeshes to me with this date, be Mekudeshes to me with this date, be Mekudeshes to me with this date, because we said if there's no Shava Pruta in any one date, she's not Mekudeshes, and that's true even if she doesn't eat any of the dates. So it can't be talking about the first Mishnah. So Ella Asefa Vafilu Bikamaisa Vahamilvahi. So that so what's the alternative? That the hungry girl case is going on the second case where a man said, Be Mikudeshis to me only one time, with this date and with this date and with this date. So what are you telling me? That as long as one of the dates is a Shava Pruta, she'll be Mikudeshis, but that's a problem. You're telling me even if the first date is a Shava Pruta, she's Mikudeshis, but what if the man said, the man has expressed his desire that she should only be Mikudeshis once she receives all three dates? So by giving her the first date, and he says, Hareya Mikudeshis li bizu, and before he finishes his statement, she eats that date. How could you tell me that that is enough, as long as it's a Shava Pruta, how can you tell me that she's Mikudeshis with that? He's expressed his desire that he doesn't want the mechanism of Kiddushin to work until she receives the third date. So it doesn't make any sense. That's He's actually asked her to hold on to the date for safekeeping until she receives the third date. I mean, this is all implicit, but this, but this is what he's basically saying. He's got three dates, and he puts the first one in her hand, bizu, and he's uve, and then before he has a chance to say anything more, she swallows the first date. But how can she be mikudeshis with that first date, even if it has a shava pruta? He's only asked her to hold on to it until he completes the process, and therefore the mechanism can't work yet. So the Gemara's answer is, so Amar Rabbi Yochanan Hare Shulchan Vahare Basar Vahare Sakin Ve'ein Lanu Pele Echol. So Rabbi Yochanan uses a nice, very colorful metaphor, basically to say that we got a bomb of Akasha. He says, "Look, we got a table, we got meat, we got a knife. There's only one problem: there's no mouth to eat with. We have no way of explaining what this mission is talking about. What do we? What is the case of hungry girl coming to to add to?" 
So Rav Shmuel Amri to Ravai who la Olam Aresha velomi baya ka Amar lomi baya manachas di ika shava pruta in ilolo avalocheles holo mikarva haniyasa imagamru umiknaya nafsha kamash mulan. So Rav and Shmuel tell you no. Really, the case of Hungry Girl is going on the first case where a man divided his statement into three separate sentences. And here's the Chiddush. You might have thought that the only time that she's not Mekudesh is because each date is less than a Shavapruta is because she's just holding on to the dates. But maybe if she swallows the, the one of the dates, even though it's less than a Shavapruta, since she shows that she's so happy to receive the date because she eats it immediately, you might say that even if it's less than a Shavapruta, that's considered a Kiddushin because look how readily she accepts it and eats it, munches on it right away. Because we remember we had said before, what's the reason that less than a Shavapruta doesn't work? It's because a Jewish girl is not going to let herself be married with less than a Shavapruta. But if she readily accepts it and, and eats it right away, then that's a sign that she is willing to be Mikudeshis with that date. You might have thought, therefore, that she is Mikudeshis. So therefore, the Mishnah says, no, even if she eats it, if it's less than a Shavapruta, she's not Mikudeshis. But Rabbi Ami Omar La'ilam Asefa. Rabbi Ami says, I disagree. Hungry girl is going on the second case where he only makes one sentence. You are mikudeshes to me with this, with this, and with this. He says, Umay ad shiyehi be'echas mehen shavapruta, ad shiyehi b'achrona shavapruta. And Rabbi, Rabbi Ami says, when the Mishnah says that one of the dates has to be worth a shavapruta, it means the last of the three dates has to be worth a shavapruta because by then, once she's received all three dates, and and she's eaten all three dates, if the last of the three dates that she's eating right away is worth the Shavapruta, since by the time she received the third date, the man wants the Kiddushan to be Chal, so as soon as she eats that third date, she's Mekudeshes. I mean, as soon as she receives it, even though she ate it right afterwards, she's Mekudeshes because it had a Shavapruta. In other words, even though the previous dates she ate already um, um, before the mechanism of Kiddushin was to take effect. As long as the last item she receives is worth a Shavapruta, that's when the husband wants the mechanism to take effect. And therefore, it's perfectly a valid, a valid Kiddushin. That's the way you have to understand the case. Amar Rav Shmami Nami de Rebbe Ami Tlas. We can infer from this whole discussion with Rebbe Ami three things. Shmami Na Hamekadesh B'Milva Eina Mekudeshes. First of all, this was a whole discussion in the first parak of Kiddusha. If I lend a woman money and then I say you can keep the loan, you don't have to pay it back. If I haven't given her anything, is that Kiddusha or not? So you see from Rebbe Ami that she's not Mekudeshes. There has to be actually a presentation of an object of value at the time when I want the Kiddushin, to, or at the moment that I want the Kiddushin to take effect. And if there's nothing transferred to her at the moment when I want the Kiddushin to take effect, so then even if I'm forgiving something, then it's not a Kiddushin. And how do you see that? Because we said that if she eats the first date, that's worth the Shavapruta, but the husband didn't want the mechanism of Kiddushin to take place until he gave her the third date. And therefore, it's not going to work. So you see that the, you can't be Makadish B'milva. Ushma minah Makadish B'milva upruta daita apruta. The second thing that we can infer from this whole discussion is that if a man gives a woman a loan, and then he gives her a pruta with which to be Mekudeshes, even though he says, I want you to be Mekudeshes to me with both of them, since she's focusing on the object that he's giving to her at the moment of the Kiddushan that he wants to take effect, she is Mekudeshes. We don't say, well, since she thinks that maybe she's getting a forgiveness of the loan, that in consideration of that she's Mekudeshes and that doesn't work. No, 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 no. As long as she gets that third date, and eats it after, you know, and receives it and eats it after the husband wants the mechanism to take effect, we say that's a valid kiddushin, and it's not in any way tainted or invalidated by the husband having given her the first two dates. Ushmami no. And the third thing that we can infer from Rabbi Ami's case is mos ba'al machozer. That when a person erroneously gives a girl uh, money for kid, maybe close the door, Mendel. When a man, thank you. When a man erroneously gives a, a girl uh, an object of value for the sake of kiddushin, and when I say what I mean by erroneously, he thinks that it's going to work for kiddushin, but it doesn't really work. 
So the, what, what, what did what did Rebbe Ami call that? He called that he called it a milva. He called that a loan. So what does that indicate? That you can't say that the husband is moichalit. He's not moichalit. He only gave it to her for the sake of kiddushin. If it doesn't work for kiddushin, then it's a loan, and he wants it back. That's why the language of milva is used in not matana. So therefore we see for the, the third halacha that we can infer from this whole discussion is that if you give a girl money for kiddushin, but for whatever reason it doesn't work, then she has to return the object to you. Okay, very good. Let's go on in a related issue. It's more hamakadesh achoso rav omar mos chosum shmuel omar mos matana. What if a man gives his sister money for kiddushin? He says, I read makudeshes li betabazu. Clearly that there's no kiddushin, right? There's obviously no kiddushin. You can't marry your sister. The question is, does she get to keep the the gift or not? So Rav says she has to return the gift, and Shmuel says no, she gets to keep it. Rav Omar Mos Chosrim Adam Yodeyash Adam Yodeyash Ein Kiddushin Tovsim Bachoso VeGomar Venosan Lushum Pikadon. So the reason why Rav says she has to give it back is because everyone knows that you can't marry your sister, so why did he give it to her? He, give it to, he gave it to her because he wanted her to hold on to it for a moment while, let's say, he went to the bathroom or something, right? And then, Velema Lalushum Pikadon Sabra Lo Mikabla. So why didn't he just say to her, uh, do me a favor, hold on to this, I'll be right back. The answer is, is because she, they, they have a very difficult relationship, and he thought maybe she won't agree to, to watch it for me while I, I have to go somewhere. So he gave, made up this cockamamie story, with this ring you'll marry me. And everyone knows that she's got to give it, that it's not a kiddushin, so, but she was so startled, she holds holding on to it and he runs away. And then he comes back and he'll be able to retrieve it. Ushmuel sover mos matana, adam yodeya she'en kiddushin tov simbacho, so vegomer venosan l'shum matana. Shmuel disagrees. Shmuel says no. Everyone knows that you can't marry your sister, so why did he give her the ring? He gave it to her as a gift. And therefore, she can keep it. So then, why didn't he just say outright, "Sister, I want you to have a gift"? The answer is, he thought that she would be too proud; it would be embarrassing for her to accept charity. So therefore, he just uh, gives it to her by saying, "You're mikudeshes." And I guess by the time she comes to her senses, he's already gone, and she gets to keep the gift. What? Okay. Masiv Ravina, Hamafrish Chalaso Kemach, Eino Chala, Vigezel Biad Kohen. So Ravina challenges this. You're going to see which one he's going to challenge in just a minute. Um, he's going to challenge Shmuel because Shmuel says that if you give something someone, if you give someone something uh, that halachically doesn't work, the person still gets to keep it as a gift. What if a Yisrael? takes his challah tithe before <coughs> the flour turns into dough. Okay? Now, when are you supposed to take the challah tithe? After the flour is mixed with water. That's when you're supposed to take challah. What if the Yisrael says, you know what I'll do? I'll give you a cup of flour, and that'll be my challah tithe. So the halacha is that it's not considered to be a valid tithe, and the Kohen has to return the cup of flour to the Yisrael. So the Gemara says, but I don't understand. According to Yushmuel, if a person, it's clear as day that you're not allowed to take chala before the before it turn, the flower turns to dough. So why don't we say, since it was patently clear that what this guy do, was doing was not a mitzvah of chala, he meant to give the kohen a gift. So he just gave him a cup of flour. So why should he have to give back the cup of flour? According to Yishmuel, he should get to keep it. It should be a matana. So the Gemara answers, Shiny hasam denafik chor v'mina, zimnin de islei lekohen pachos mechamesh rivaim kemach, v'hai olish lei bahadi hadadi, ksavr niskana isaso ve'asi lemeich la betivla. The Gemara says, I'll tell you why. Shmuel will tell you, in this case, I agree that the Kohen has to give it back. You know why? Because if he doesn't give it back, something very destructive could happen. What's going to happen? The coin might mistakenly think that this cup of flour is not tevil anymore, and it's not subject to the laws of challah. Now, we all know that when you bake bread, you need a certain requisite amount in order to become chayiv in the mitzvah of challah. 
they say around a five pound bag of uh, flour is the minimum you need in order to be able to make a bracha of, you know, to, 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 to separate challah. So what happens if the Kohen has less than that amount, but with this cup of flour, it adds up to that amount? The Kohen will think, well, I'm going to add this cup of flour that I received, but this cup of flour is not subject to the challah tithe, so it doesn't add up to, it doesn't augment the stuff that I, that, that I have on my own that's, uh, that has not been tithed, and therefore the whole mixture is not subject to the mitzvah of challah. And that's the destructive thing that's going to happen because the Kohen is mistakenly going to think that this cup of flour is not subject to the laws of challah anymore when really it is. He'll mix it with a larger amount of flour, will make dough. Really, it's chayiv in the mitzvah of challah and the Kohen will think it's not and he's going to end up eating untithed dough. Okay? So the Gemara now says, the ha'amart adam yodeya shein mafrishin challah kemach. But wait a minute, why is the Kohen going to make such a mistake? Everyone knows that you can't tithe your challah tithe before it turns into dough. So the Gemara answers, Yodeya ve'ena Yodeya. Yodeya she'en mafrishin challah kemach ve'ena Yodeya desavr tamayo mai mishum tircha de Kohen ve tircha de Kohen achilte. So the Gemara says, no, it's really, people know that you can't take challah until it turns into dough. But this Kohen might mistakenly think that the reason why you can't do that is only out of an accommodation to the Kohen, because it's a tircha for the Kohen to take a dry flour tithe before it's ready-made and mixed into dough. So therefore, maybe the Kohen says, well, you know what, I'll be a nice guy, and I'll be moichel, and I'll allow this tithe to be considered the chala tithe, and Itaka will think, that it's only out of an accommodation to the coin. As long as the coin is moichel, then it is good, a, a good chalatai. Frak the Gemara, v'tihavi truma velo te'achel, ad shiyotzi aleha chala mimakom acher. But then I have another question, says the Gemara. If a person mistakenly takes truma, okay, or chala, then the halacha should be that it should have a din of tevel, right, and you should have to tithe it from some other place. And the Kohen should get to keep it as long as we require him to tithe it from some other source, it should be considered to be acceptable for him to keep. Because Milo Tanan, don't we have a Mishnah that says, Min Hanakiv al Sha'ino Nakiv Truma Velote Achala Shiyotzi Alea Truma Maisumi Makom Acher. That there, because there's a similar case where there's a Mishnah that says that if you have two troughs of grain growing. One trough has holes on the bottom of it and is connected to the ground and is therefore subject midiorisa in the laws of truma. There's another trough which has no holes in the bottom and therefore is like growing hydroponically, right? And is therefore not subject to the laws of truma. If I go ahead and I take truma from the from the uh, grain that is chayiv in truma, and I take from some of that and use it to tithe my grain that's not subject in the laws of, of truma, so then the halacha is I haven't really taken truma, right? And therefore this uh, grain that I've taken really has a din of tevel, that it's um, uh, truma, so we assign it the status of truma, provided that you tithe from it from some other source to make sure that Itaka has a din of not, not being tevel anymore. So why don't we basically assign this chala flour, this cup of flour that was given by the Israel to the Kohen, as having a din of chala, it's permitted to the Kohen, but what we should do is we should require the Kohen to tithe from it from some other source. That's all we should have to do, but let the Kohen keep the, keep, keep the flour. So the Gemara answers, betray money tzoyis, bechad manalot tzoyis. The Gemara answers no. He says, the reason why we allow that tithing to be considered a tithing is because people will listen to us if we tell them that they made an error when, you, when we're talking about two units of grain, two units of, um, two separate uh, sections of grain. Their people can much more easily understand that an error has been made, and therefore if we tell the person, listen, we're going to let you count this as a tithe, but you have to retithe, you have to sort of retithe the grain that you thought you were tithing, you have to retithe it. Um, 
So then, people will listen because they they can understand that you made an error because you were dealing with two different units of, of grain. But with one unit, when a person, when a Yisrael takes a cup of flour and you tell him that, you know, what was done was not correct, you have to retithe, right? So then people are not going to listen because they think they've done everything correctly. Um, so, um, like like Rashi says, he says, if a Kohen receives that kind of truma, and you tell him, you know, Reb Yid, that was not a proper truma tithe, you're going to, it's still considered to be tevel, because the Yisrael who gave it to you made an error because he tithed from one trough that was chayev onto a trough that was putter, so the coin will listen, he'll say, okay, so the Yisrael made a mistake because he was dealing with two different units of grain. But bechadman, a kegon chalas kemach shenil al kemach hanoisar, that so shenitla al kemach hanoisar sham ki amart lei lekoin ena chala chazor v'afresh alei alot zayisla lefiha chitzrichu lahachazira. So he says, the Kohen's not going to listen to you. He's going to say, how can you tell me that the Yisrael made such a fundamental error? He took flour from, a, from, from one unit of flour. So what, why, should, why do I have to do with it? And therefore, since the Kohen's not going to listen to you, the only recourse is to make the Kohen return it back. The Eboy is Ema. And now I'll give you another answer, says the Gemara, why this is not analogous. The reason why the Kohen has to give back the flour and why it's not analogous to a... Uh, a gift that was given, or, you know, like the, the, where Shmuel says that if something, a person meant for a halachic mechanism to take place and it doesn't take place, we consider it a gift, is la'olam koin meitzas tzayis, ukesavr balabayis niskana isaso, va'asi lamechel betivla. So the answer is really that a kohen will taka listen. If we were to tell him, if our only concern was the kohen making an error, we, we'd let the Kohen keep the flower, and we would just tell him that he has to retie it because it's Tevel. I, what's our concern? Not, concern is not the Kohanim. The Kohanim are reason. The Kohanim are very careful about halacha. Our concern is the Balabas. The Balabas took a cup of flour from his flour uh, you know, supply. He gave it to the Kohen. So he thinks that he's completely taken the, done the mitzvah of challah, and so he can now use the rest of his flour, right? But he might come to eat it erroneously, <laughs> thinking that it's already tithe, and he'll eat it when it's really tevel. I but didn't you tell me that everyone knows that you can't take challah when it's flour? So why would the balabas make such a mistake? Answers the Gemara: Yodeya ve'ena Yodeya. He knows, but he doesn't really know. Yodeya she'ein mafrishin chalakemach ve'ena Yodeya this other time of my mishum tircha de koin tircha de koin kibla alei. That the Balabayas thinks, the Yisrael, the Balabas, is going to think that maybe the reason why you can't take challah from a cup of flour is only lechatchila, because you don't want to burden the Kohen. It's an inconvenience for the Kohen, but if I find the Kohen is willing to accept it, <coughs> maybe taka the halacha is that I fulfilled the mitzvah of challah. And he's therefore going to say that bidiyev, I fulfilled the mitzvah of challah, and the rest of my flower is mutter. That's why we say no, the Kohen has to talk and give it back to him so he recognizes that he's still dealing with tevel. Frek the Gemara v'tihave truma v'yachsar v'yitrom. But one second, why don't we just say that let the Kohen keep the cup of flour, and it should be considered to be uh, truma, and just have, you just have to re, re-tithe that amount. So Milo Tnan, Mishaino Nakov Ala Nakov Truma Viachsar Viyutrum, didn't we learn in in the Mishnah? The opposite case, when you have two troughs of grain, but instead of tithing from the chai of grain onto the putter grain, you tithe from the putter grain onto the chai of grain. So that's 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 what this is analogous to. Like Rashi says, Vinihabi Truma Viachsar Vitrum, Alamahis Kikula Hachsar, Miyirazu. Um, so he says, like Rashi says, why do we require the coin to give back the cup of flour to the Israel? Why don't we just tell the Israel to go ahead and retithe? Just go ahead and retithe, just like we say over there, that if a person makes an error, taking from something that is putter and using it as for something that's chayiv, then we just tell him to go ahead and redo it. So how kim the betray money tzois bechad monolot tzois? The Gemara says because when you tell a, a, a Jew that he's made a mistake because he's tithed from one unit onto another unit, he'll be able to appreciate that he's made an error and will repeat his tithing.
But if you tell a Yid, I'm sorry, you've made an error, he's going to say, how could I, have, with one unit of grain, how could I have made an error with one unit of grain? There's only one uh, bag of flour here. I've tithed it properly, and therefore I'm not going to listen to you. And therefore the only recourse in order to demonstrate to him that he's made a fundamental error is to return the, the flower to him so that he'll know that he has to retithe. So frack the Gemara of so is, you mean since when will a Yisrael not listen if you tell him that he's made an error with one unit? Look at the following Mishnah. The Mishnah says that if a person tithes using a bitter gourd or a sour watermelon. So the halacha is that we make him redo it because the fruit is bad. The fruit is bad tasting. And when you tithe, you have to tithe from good tasting fruit for the rest of the crop, not from bad tasting fruit. So you see that even though he's tithed from one unit of produce, we still tell him that if he's made a mistake, he'll listen to us and he'll retithe. So the Gemara answers, shiny hasam de midiaraisa truma ma'al yehi midarebi iloi. Ah, that's different. Because in that situation, technically he's done a proper tithing. Bidiyevit, his tithing is proper. It's only midarabonim that we make him retithe. And that's why we tell him, go ahead, just just retithe and, and you're okay. Da'ama rebi iloi, minayn latorim min harala yafesha truma so truma. As Rabbi Eloi says, how do you know that if a person tithes by taking a piece of produce that's bad tasting, that bidiyevit, the tithing is still a tithe? Because the Torah says, do not bear a sin when you take truma. So what do those words mean, do not bear a sin when you take truma? The sin is that bidiyevit, you've taken truma, but you've done it in a less than proper way because you've taken bad tasting fruit and you've designated that as your truma. When in reality, you're supposed to take good quality produce and designate it as the truma. But you see that bidiyevit, if you did it, it's a proper tithing. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a sin involved. We would just say your, your action is null and void. From here, we see that when you tithe a bad tasting fruit and you designate that as your truma, the tithe bidiyevit is still a tithe. And that's why we tell him that only midirabonan do you have to retithe because midiraisi you were yotze. So in reality, when a person violated only a rabbinic protocol of tithing, we tell him, go ahead and redo it. And we say that a person will listen to us. And, if, and the worst that will happen is if he doesn't listen to us, then bidiyevit, the tithing is a tithe. But in our situation over here, by the case of Chala, we're concerned that if we don't force the coin to return the cup of flour, the person is not going to listen to us and, and retithe. He's going to say, I did what I was supposed to do, leave me alone. And for that reason, because he may end up with, therefore, tevel flour, and which he's going to think, ah, it's just a chumrah, I don't have to do anything with it. That's why we force the coin to give the cup of flour back. But we still defend Shmuel by saying that in other situations where there's not going to be a kill call, there's not going to be anything destructive happening as a result of the person keeping the item, we consider it to be a gift. We'll hold it here for today. Uh, good morning.